Ah, oh, she's a beauty. Let's get started. When we discuss the integumentary system, it's worth noting that the structures of the integumentary system, the structures are skin, hair, and nails. And the function, we put down one function of the integumentary system, which is protection. There is more to it than that, but in fact, what we're discussing today is purely protection. So today we're discussing the epidermis. We're going to be talking about the cells and the layers, and then also the most common types of skin cancers, which all, all three of which we're going to be discussing are cancers that are localized uh, mostly to the epidermis. So when we discuss the epidermis, it is the outermost portion of skin. It can be as shallow as uh, 0.05 millimeters. For example, on the eyelids, you're, you may know that it's quite thin skin there. Um, so your very thinnest skin, the epidermis is only going to be 0.05 millimeters, but it can be as thick as 1.5 millimeters if you're talking about some place that is subject to more abrasion, such as the palms of the hand or the soles of the feet. So there's quite a difference in how thick the epidermis is, but as you can see, it is just the very most superficial portion of the skin. The dermis is deep to that, and then the hypodermis, or the subcutaneous layer, oftentimes just called the subcute, will be deep to that. We'll cover those in a different video. So today, we're focusing on only the epidermis. There's so much to say about the epidermis, and I really don't want the lessons to blend together. So we're only focusing on the epidermis here, and therefore, we're going to pull this out and make uh, another cube. We take a cube out of your skin. There, it looks like that, <laughs> I guess. Um, but we're only looking at the very, very most superficial part of this, although we are representing it. It's over overrepresented here, so we're going to make it, you know, so that we can actually study it. We're, we're just taking the, the most superficial la layer of the skin so that we can take a closer look at the epidermis in isolation. And as you can see, there are these what we call papillae or nipple-like projections that kind of um, scoot up into the epidermis. They are actually parts of the dermis. And so I'll just go ahead and label that here. But we, again, we're focusing on the epidermis. Off to the left-hand side here, we're gonna start to draw a key. Um, we're gonna be filling into the epidermis. We're basically gonna fill it up with cells. And there's four different cells that we're going to be drawing. And as we draw them, we're also going to be discussing the layers of the epidermis. So we're going to start off by filling in most of our keratinocytes, which you'll notice I'm drawing in orange. You'll also notice that there are several different shapes to the keratinocytes, from nice and round to sort of an oval to really, really flat. And so we're going to start off with the superficial most layer of the epidermis, and we're going to start our keratinocytes. This, these aren't really cells at this point. Um, so the, at the superficial most layer, you have cells that are thin, flattened and dead. They're not even really cellular material. The word keratinocyte, you'll see two pertinent words in there. The root C-Y-T-E means cell and keratin is a protein that gives toughness, toughness to anything that it's a part of. So a keratinocyte is a keratin containing cell. So the big protein here, of course, is going to be keratin and it gives good physical protection to the skin. There are four different cells we're going to be looking at. One of the things you might want to focus on is what type of protection each of these cells conveys to the skin. So keratinocytes, it's easy. Simple physical protection keeps most things out. And just little flakes in here. Um, the, this layer of the, um, of the epidermis is called the stratum corneum. It is about 30, 10 to 30 layers thick. So it's relatively thick, but it, it's important that you have the ability to shed all of these parts of the stratum corneum. You shed about 40 pounds of this thing over the course of your lifetime. Most of the dust in your house is stratum corneum. Welcome to anatomy and physiology, huh? All right, so the next layer we're going to be drawing is going to be the stratum lucidum. The stratum lucidum is about two cell layers thick. It's not found in all of the parts of your... Um, of your skin. Now, not all of your skin has a stratum uh, lucidum. Stratum lucidum is usually found in the thickest of skin, so palms of the hand, soles of the feet. Um, the stratum lucidum is made of cells that are, they're pretty much dead at this point. They're kind of getting ready to become stratum corneum. I, they're, they are translucent and not found in all skin parts. <laughs> 
All right, the next layer down is a pretty interesting one. It is the stratum granulosum. Now you'll notice that the cells are starting to get a little bit thicker as we move deeper into the epidermis. The stratum granulosum is about two to three cell layers thick. As the name implies, the stratum granulosum keratinocytes, the cells of the stratum granulosum have granules. So it turns out that at this layer, the stratum granulosum, you start to secrete some substances. These cells are really close to being dead, but they do still have a little bit of cellular activity, and so they, their last gasp of activity is to secrete waterproofing glycolipids. And what that does is it basically, you know, that you know, focus on the word lipid, lipid, it's fat, that basically becomes a mortar that holds the cells together. So from the stratum granulosum up, as the cells begin to move upward into the stratum lucidum and then the stratum corneum, and they continue on their trajectory to become truly dead and just, you know, um, the, re the remnants of cells. At this point, the cells are basically bricks with this lipid in between them that makes the skin truly waterproof. And so this is the stratum granulosum. We're actually going to be skipping over a layer here. We're gonna skip over the stratum spinosum because it's, it's a pretty interesting layer, but I think it's more useful to skip right down into the basal most layer, the lowest layer, the most deep layer of the epidermis. And this is going to be the stratum basale. So the stratum basale is made, as you can see, there's plenty of keratinocytes. These keratinocytes are metabolic, metabolically active, and in fact, they are mitotic. You'll notice that I'm skipping quite a bit of space between them. We have to make room for a, a different, two different populations of cells. So fill up about two thirds of this layer with keratinocytes, and then the other cells will fill in around that. And again, the keratinocytes at this point are mitotic, which means that they are regenerating all the time. Um, so this is the stratum basale. And again, the keratinocytes are young, they're vibrant, they're actually dividing. And so this is the layer from which all the other layers grow. It starts at the stratum basale, this base most layer, and then the cells move superficially and become less and less metabolic as they move upward. But here, at the start of their life, basically, the stratum basale, the keratinocytes are quite active. Now we're going to be filling in some cells in blue. These are going to be cells that are actually sensitive to touch. Um, these are called tactile cells. And I'm going to also fill in uh, nerve ending endings here. So sensory nerve endings. I did do it in yellow, which I know is not showing up super well in this paper. And I was just gonna take that chance. I probably should have done gray. But yellow is traditionally used for nerve fibers, so I thought it would be, um, it would be helpful. And besides, it's not the nerve fibers that are in the dermis that we're really focused on. We're, we're, we're focused on the tactile cells themselves. So you can see even in the epidermis, which again, just to remind you, we're only looking at the epidermis, only the most superficial portion of the skin, a really, really thin layer. There's still quite a lot going on here. You have tactile cells that are actually sensitive to touch here, not in the dermis, but actually right up at the most superficial layer of the skin in the epidermis. So there are the tactile cells. And so, um, and they are quite sensitive. They're quite sensitive to touch. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and skip up into the stratum spinosum and we're gonna draw ourselves some dendritic cells. And we're gonna draw these in green. It's a simple cell with a nucleus in there. <laughs> Um, I'm not drawing nuclei in all of these cells, but uh, I thought it was good to draw them in these guys anyway. So we're drawing tendrils that kind of extend from the dendritic cells. This is kind of how they look. Dendritic cells are important because they're actually a portion of the immune system. They are actually phagocytes. The root phago means, um, phago is a root that means stomach or digestion. And again, C-Y-T-E means cell. So it is a digesting cell. And you'll notice that these are actually up above. They're superficial to the most mitotic cells, uh, which are the keratinocytes in the stratum basale. So these dendritic cells are capable of monitoring for pathogens. If by chance any kind of pathogen, which does happen if you have a little cut or a scrape, 
some pathogens are very likely to start to penetrate through here because you have a boatload of bacteria swimming along the surface of your skin. So the moment you get a cut or a scrape or anything, you're probably allowing a lot of pathogens into at least into the um, a portion of the epidermis. And it's if it does manage to get down into this cell layer, which is the stratum spinosum, then you will have dendritic cells there to immediately consume them. And if it is something particularly caustic or numerous, then these, not only will they consume them, but they will go ahead and alert the main portion of the immune system, which is deeper inside of the body. They will go and alert the rest of the immune system. You know, we got some bacteria incoming. Let's be careful. We might have to start to fight against, you know, we might have to start to mount quite an attack against this. And you would see as part of that, like for example, an inflammatory event, redness, heat, and swelling. Um, if you did have some kind of uh, bacteria or pathogen coming along and causing a problem. So the start of that whole thing is actually going to be these dendritic cells that are right there in the epidermis. As you can see then what I'm doing is I, I started off by drawing the dendritic cells and I'm just filling it around there. Everything else that you see in this particular cell layer will be a nice metabolic, still living, still vibrant keratinocyte. It hasn't yet started its trajectory through the stratum granulosum. All right, so in the key over here, I'm going to go ahead and put dendritic cells down. And then we'll go ahead and label the layer. This is the stratum spinosum, so-called because it has, it has these spiny looking structures in it, which would be the dendritic cells. It is time for us to discuss perhaps the most exciting cell that is found in the epidermis, simply because there's so much to say about it. So the melanocytes or the melanocytes will be discussed next. As the name suggests, C-Y-T-E means cell, and melano means that it contains a pigment called melanin. So I'm going to go ahead and color the cell body so you can really differentiate. I'm doing this one in brown which now that I'm looking at it, it kind of blends in with <laughs> the orange. So I'm glad that I colored those cell bodies there. And you'll notice again that it has these tendrils. Okay, so the point of melanin, the point of melanin is what it does is it takes melanin and it actually um, sticks it into the uh, keratinocytes in the region. So while those keratinocytes are still my tot, remember the keratinocytes are the orange ones. So it's the, mel the melanocytes are actually working in conjunction with the, den with the uh, keratinocytes. And what the melanocytes do is they take their melanin and they pop melanin into the keratinocytes, basically on the sunny side, the most superficial end of the keratinocyte. And the purpose of melanin is to protect the keratinocyte especially the nucleus of the keratinocyte. As I've already suggested to you, the keratinocytes in that stratum basale, in that deep most layer of the epidermis, those keratinocytes are mitotic, which means they are dividing all the time. When you have a lot of sun exposure, there's the possibility that the DNA in the nucleus could become mutated um, in the presence of some of the harmful UV rays. And then those mutations could be easily passed on because the cells are replicating all the time. So we're trying to avoid the UVA rays. UVA rays are considered the bad ones. The UVB rays can also cause damage, but they're actually helpful because they help with vitamin D synthesis. All right, melanocytes, they have this pigment called melanin. Uh, little clumps of melanocytes will form freckles. Little clumps of melanocytes will form your moles. It's oftentimes the case that a person with lots of freckles will also have pale skin. And the reason for that is that a lot of their melanocytes are clumped into the freckles and therefore there are fewer dispersed around in the paler skin around the freckles. Hopefully that makes sense. Usually on exams, I put down a true false question that says something like, a person with darker skin has darker skin because they have more melanocytes? The answer is false. It turns out that in a person with darker skin versus a person with lighter skin, 
the number of melanocytes is actually about the same, but what happens is the melanocytes are going to be much more active in a person who has been exposed to more sun, especially if this has happened over generation after generation after generation. This is a really good example of epigenetics. The same structure, the melanocyte, can behave quite differently depending on the environmental conditions. So a person who has a long history of their family, gener generation after generation, living close to the equator, their skin is going to be much, much darker. But if a person lives further north, up near the Arctic Circle, for example, their skin tends to be much paler. Why? Because you want to have as much melanin as possible if you live close to the equator to protect you from those UVA rays that are harmful. But if you live way up north, you don't have to worry about the UVA rays, but you do have to worry about the fact that you're getting so little sun that you might not get enough UVB rays, and therefore you might not be able to manufacture vitamin D. As the generations move on, and as you start to have more and more um, either melanocytes that are less active or melanocytes that are more active, your skin pigmentation can alter quite a bit. Uh, and this can actually happen over the course of just a few generations. But I think that um, if you look at the difference of a person from Norway versus a person from, um, from Uganda, we all started off living close to the equator, so we all started off with darker skin, and we evolved the lighter skin that we have as we moved north from, uh, further away from the equator. And it only took about 50,000 years to experience that pretty profound difference in skin pigmentation, and so this is the perfect example of epigenetics. We still have about the same number of melanocytes, but the further north you live, the less active those melanocytes will be. Let us discuss the three most common types of skin cancer, which are all cancers of the cells in this region. Now, the term cancer, generally speaking, means overgrowth of cells. It turns out that you're very unlikely to form a cancerous tumor in a tissue of the body or in a cell of the body that is not already mitotic, that is all, not already regenerative. So it is in those areas of the body that do have regenerating cells that you are going to have your cancers. And this happens to be one of the places that is quite mitotic. Remember the stratum basale? The stratum basale has keratinocytes that are replicating all the time, that are regenerating all the time, undergoing mitosis. And therefore, you will start to develop, it's possible to start to develop cancers in this region. The first of them is basal cell carcinoma. As the name suggests, basal cell carcinoma that commences from the basal layer of the epidermis. Now, squamous cell carcinoma also arises from keratinocytes. Um, generally, they're going to be keratinocytes in these more uh, deep regions, either the stratum basale or the stratum spinosum. In either case, in basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, it is a disease where the keratinocytes are overgrown. Generally speaking, the uh, prognosis is good with either of these cancers. You can um, usually just use a surgery. A surgical excision would remove the issue. Both of these cancers tend to be found in areas where sun exposure is a problem, the hands, the face, um, the ears, the tips of the ears. So they are mostly caused by damaging UV rays. And melanoma, as the name suggests, is a cancer of the melanocytes. And uh, as we stipulated earlier, melanocytes will make up things like freckles and moles. And so any kind of new growth of a freckle or a new growth of a mole or a pre-existing mole that starts to grow or starts to become misshapen, oftentimes we're looking at the margins of that. A dermatologist will excise something like that so that you can biopsy the tissue and take a look at whether there's any abnorm abnormal cells there. The issue with melanocytes is that for some reason, as they spread horizontally, they also start to spread deep. So when we look at basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, they will spread. They will start to have tumors, basically. Um, but surgical removal is usually enough because the horizontal growth doesn't equate to vertical growth and it usually basically resolves the issue. 
Um, so squamous cell carcinoma sometimes spreads quite a lot, and it's possible to metastasize at that point. However, uh, melanocytes, uh, when they grow side to side, they also tend to grow deep. And so you'll see the margins start to widen, the diameter of the mole starts to widen, and then there can be the assumption that there is also a depth to the tumor as well. Now, a deep tumor is a problem because the deeper you go, the closer you are to the blood supply. The epidermis itself has no blood supply, but there is a blood supply just below it. There are blood vessels just deep to the stratum basale, just deep to the lowest limits of the epidermis. And if there is there, if there are cancerous cells that start to penetrate close to those blood vessels, it's possible that some of those cells could actually get into the blood and therefore the, we, the word we use for it is metastasis. If a tumor metastasizes, that means the cells have penetrated into the blood supply. It could potentially spread to other areas of the body, which is the most serious ramification of a cancer. Always. Metastasis is always the end result we're trying to avoid. If there's any possibility of metastasis or spreading even to neighboring lymph nodes with melanoma, it's, rec uh, it's recommended chemotherapy, radiation, the standard treatments that we always use for cancer treatments, a very serious cancer treatment. Um, but in the early stages, you can do wide excision, basically removing not just the mole that you're looking at, but also wide areas around that and deep to that in order to try to cut off the tumor before it spreads into the blood. So the sooner that we can, well, with any cancer, the sooner that we can catch it, the earlier the stages, the better off we are. And this is quite true of melanocytes, of, of melanoma. You want to make sure to catch it in the early stages so that it doesn't start to penetrate into the blood supply.